May it please the court, counsel. My name is John Chapman, and I'm here representing the appellant, Dr. Mark DiStefani. I'd still like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Sure. If it makes your life any happier or clearer, please take me entirely out of the will. Those were the words of the appellee, Victoria DiStefani, to her mother, Martha, in a letter that she left for her mother in the fall of 2002. Well, Martha did just that. She acted upon that letter. She contacted her longstanding estate planning attorney, Fran DeGraw, and instructed her to prepare the First Amendment to Third Amendment and Restatement of Trust, removing Victoria from her estate plan. This document was signed in January of 2003 and was one of the documents which the court found that Mark was guilty of undue influencing the execution of that trust amendment. The record showed that Martha did a lot of estate planning documents in the 1990s. She executed a numeral trust, trust amendments, irrevocable trust documents, almost all of them with Fran DeGraw, her estate planning attorney. She also proved over and over again that she could either add or subtract various family members and friends as beneficiaries from her estate, depending upon her whims at the time. In evidence in 1990, Martha did a trust document where she removed, she specifically excluded Victoria in 1990. She even had a provision in that document that said if Victoria challenged it, that any child of hers would likewise be excluded. A few years later, she executed a document where she excluded her son, Antonio, or Tony. She excluded her from her estate plan, but yet in 2002, 2003, when she yet again excludes Victoria, it is now supposedly Mark's fault. I've cited the case, and I believe for the most part, the law, the appellee and the appellates don't disagree a whole lot on what the law is. In fact, our trial briefs probably could have been, other than the facts, could have mimicked each other. But it's clear that one sitting and set aside a document bears a heavy burden on undue influence. I've cited this Durabancian case, which cites other cases, but essentially it says in order for an undue influence to exist, such as may authorize invalidation of a will, it must amount to over-persuasion, duress, force, coercion, or artful or fraudulent contrivances to such a degree that there is a destruction of the free agency and willpower of the one making the will. Mere affection, kindness, or attachment of one person over another may not itself constitute undue influence. I suggest in this case there was no evidence of influence, undue or otherwise. But it was the burden of Victoria to prove first as to the trust amendments that they were due to the undue influence of Mark. And one of the ways you can do that, I've talked about the carpenter factor showing active influence. Mark was admittedly a substantial beneficiary in the 2003 trust amendment. He was admittedly occupied a confidential position of trust with his mother. But the question was first whether he was, whether there was active procurement. And you can look at the carpenter factors, both the, both I and the counsel for Apelli have gone through the carpenter factors on our own. The court made no specific findings as to which carpenter factors, if any, were present. But I would suggest to the court that there were not sufficient factors present to have found active procurement. And I don't know the answer to this, but the attorney who did the 2003 amendment, did that attorney have any relationship to other members of the family? No, she did not. There's no evidence at all. She was from, I believe, a 2002 document, was the first document that Fran DeGraw prepared for Martha. And the evidence there, I believe the evidence was it may have been referred by her stockbroker at the time from Naples, although Fran DeGraw was clearly somebody who was residing in Winter Park. And it was unclear whether or not Fran DeGraw ever met Martha in person. I believe Fran DeGraw testified that she had, but there was no other evidence supporting that. But she drafted all of the estate planning documents which are in question, other than the 1990 will, excluding Victoria, which was drafted by another attorney someplace. And what kind of, 
notes are there in her file as to the 2003 amendment? There are, and they're detailed. Her files were very, very detailed as far as she kept notes as far as telephone calls or what have you. There's a note in the 2002 that says that Mark had called her, and Mark said, I've been handling my mother's financial affairs, and she wants to make me trustee. That's all the communication is as to the 2003 amendment. And there's nothing in that note that says, oh, we want to take Victoria out or anything like that. But then there's several other- Is there any evidence that the woman actually called the lawyer herself or talked to the lawyer herself on the phone? There are notes where Mark is setting up a phone call, and they're coordinating a phone call between Martha and Fran DeGraw to talk about the document. And then there's also Fran's- If I recall, that is in contemplation of execution. Pardon me? That is in contemplation of execution of the document as opposed to a planning session. Well, I believe there were several calls between- There was a group of documents prepared, and then there were some other communications before they were actually signed in January. And there is a memo to- There's two memos. There's a memo to the staff saying this is what we're going to do, and then there's a memo to the file basically documenting this conversation that she had with Martha. She said basically there's no doubt in my mind that this is what she wants. And she went through, and the appellee has said it's a series of yes or no questions. It's not. She goes into a lot of detail. It's hard to imagine what more Fran DeGraw could have done to have, I guess, safeguarded Martha's intentions of what she wanted to do. Fran DeGraw testified at trial saying that there were times before where Martha wanted to remove Victoria, but she talked Martha out of it until finally in 2002 she's like, she's gone too far. I want to take her out. And that was the- Remind me if you would, by 0102, I thought she started suffering some incapacity, mental incapacity. That is true. There was evidence. There was some medical evidence at trial. It all came in through either simply just the documents themselves or through deposition testimony. There were basically three physicians who testified either through their deposition testimony or through their file. Two of them were specialists that Martha had gone to see because of memory issues, and I believe they had documented, they said, probably early dementia. But of those three doctors, only one of them was her treating physician, and that was Dr. Rates. And Dr. Rates testified through deposition at trial. Dr. Rates testified that, yes, she was suffering from some memory loss, but at least in 2002 he described her as being as sharp as a whip, he said, very well put together, could speak very well, et cetera. He did find that when he became her physician again in 2005, I believe, that she had started suffering significantly by then, and there was a rapid decline from 2005. But he had testified that even someone with signs of early dementia still can have all their cognitive abilities, can be high-functioning, everything else. So he said that, you know, yes, there was evidence that Martha was suffering from some issues as early as 2000. There was no evidence of how those were affecting her cognitive abilities at the time she executed the 2003 trust amendment, other than there was a letter from a Dr. Chin, her treating physician at the time, who opined that she could make such decisions. And in her decision, the trial court judge gave that little evidence. Unfortunately, Dr. Chin couldn't be located, and neither could his files be located. But he was her treating physician from, I believe, in 2001 through 2004, 2005. I know the record contains evidence of fairly heavy alcohol use, at least prior to her entrance to this Freedom Village location. And I don't really know whether it stopped at that point in time or whether there was still an alcohol abuse issue after she was at Freedom Village. Well, there was testimony from Victoria and from Anna, Mark's now former wife, that said, well, the family always drank a lot, and that Martha drank. And in 2000, when she would go to see the doctors, there was a recommendation that she stop drinking. And there was a lot of testimony as to what 
her drinking habits were after that. I don't believe there was any testimony that in 2002 or 2003 that Martha was continuing to drink heavily at that point in time. I do know that once she went into uh, Freedom Village, I believe they, they, have, a, they have a bar there that the, for the residents, but they're allowed, I think, one or two cocktails or something at most. They, right. they definitely regulate their, co their, their alcohol intake at that point in time uh, once she went into Freedom Village. Um, the, there were the issues, obviously, with regard to the trust amendments, and then there was the big issue with regard to the IRA designation. There were two completely separate things. Uh, at trial and in the briefs, the uh, counsel for appellee, Victoria's, tried to say this is all part of an overall scheme. Uh, but again, it was Victoria's burden to prove uh, in, uh, undue influence with regard to the IRA designation. This was the uh, tortious interference claim. She had to prove an expectancy. What was, what was her evidence of an expectancy? Well, Victoria didn't testify at all regarding an IRA designation. There was no testimony from her saying, well, yeah, mom told me I was going to be a beneficiary. There's no such thing. What there was was there were some documents where there was a letter from uh, uh, Fran DeGraw, the estate planning attorney, to Martha's um, stockbroker in, the, in 2000, I'm sorry, in like 94, 95, that said Martha would like to make both um, Victoria and Mark equal beneficiaries of her IRA rather than her trust. But then two years later, Mark, or I'm sorry, Fran is again, again writing uh, Martha and saying, hey, I think you should change the beneficiary from your trust to Mark and Victoria. But there's no evidence that it never happened. What the evidence was with that change was that Anna, again, Mark's then wife said that uh, at some point, Martha said, I want you to take me to Drew Dill's office, that was her stockbroker, so I want you to take me to his office because I want to change my IRA designation, which would have coincided with the time that she signed uh, the 2003 trust amendment. And uh, the evidence was that uh, uh, Anna testified that this is what happened. And as far as Mark's involvement, uh, Anna testified that, that Martha said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take Victoria off my IRA. And Mark's response said, was, yeah, mom, whatever. That was the only evidence whatsoever of Mark's involvement and in the IRA did designation. Did Martha actually physically go someplace to change the IRA? Did Martha? Yeah. Well, the evidence was that Anna said that she that, that Martha asked her to bring her to Drew Dill's office and that she did bring her to Drew Dill's office to make that change. Now, Drew Dill, who testified by way of affidavit, had no recollection whatsoever of what happened or anything else. He looked at the document. He did say, by, by the way, by the fact that there was different dates on the document, it appeared it could have been uh, sent out and signed and then mailed back or dropped off at his office later on. Uh, so he there said there were some things about the document that indicated that maybe perhaps it wasn't signed there, but yet he had no recollection whatsoever. But there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Mark had anything to do with it. And again, when you're looking at, uh, at tortious interference, it was Victoria's burden of proof. Her theme for the tortious interference was essentially undue influence. That was the tortious conduct was going to be the undue influence. But not only did she fail to show an expectancy in the first place, but even if she had shown an expectancy, she absolutely failed to show any involvement by Mark uh, in that you know, in, in, in Victoria's removal, if in fact there was a removal. Mark's only knowledge of anything was, it was later on in 2004, Martha moved uh, from, I think it was Oldie Discount Broker to Morgan Stanley, which coincided with her stockbroker's move from one firm to the other one. And that, at that time, Mark uh, uh, was aware of that designation at the time. But at that point, it didn't change anything because uh, the designation in 2003 listed merely Mark and his, I believe his wife Anna as a contingent beneficiary uh, under that document. So uh, certainly there was no evidence at trial, certainly no substantial competent evidence which was supported the trial court's decision uh, that Mark tortiously interfered with the IRA designation. Um, I have talked about a little bit, I'm just going to hit on it briefly about the standard of review and I, and I cited to this Kester case uh, which has facts, I think, very similar with regard to the IRA designation in particular. And this is where a mother uh, who, I believe she had uh, had uh, her daughter and two sons equal beneficiaries, and she changed 
uh, things to, uh, to uh, uh, there was a, a question about some payable on death accounts and, and other things. And essentially the court, uh, the, the trial court had found that there was uh, uh, undue influence essentially and it was reversed on appeal. And the court talked about the standard of review and it stated that it says, well, the court will not overturn a trial court's decision where there's substantial competent evidence supporting the findings unless the court misapprehends the evidence as a whole or misconceives the legal effect of the evidence. So in, in our situation here, not only do I believe that there was a lack of competent substantial evidence to support the trial court's findings, but as far as uh, a decision on finding carpenter factors on, on determining whether there's active procurement or such, those type of things are not certainly not entitled to the same deference uh, as would be a, a, a factual finding. Yeah. Is that you're my time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now you're about to... Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Brandon Ballou. I represent Victoria Di Scafani, the appellee in this case, who was successful, successful in front of the trial court in establishing that her mother's trust in both 2003 and 2006 were the result of undue influence exerted upon her by Mark Di Scafani, and who was able to recover a judgment under the theory of undue influence for half the value of an IRA that she had a reasonable certainty of inheriting but for Mark's wrongful conduct. Now here, the standard of review in this case requires this court to accept the factual findings of the trial court unless or as long as they are supported by substantial competent evidence. Now the appellant is asking this court to reevaluate that evidence and substitute its judgment for the trial court, which but it cannot do. The trial court do. have to have clear and convincing evidence on these issues, right? This is, this is not a preponderance case, am I right about that? On, on which issues, Your Honor? Well, uh, on a trust issue f f for certain, but aren't, aren't both of these things that are not greater weight but clear and convincing in the trial court? Well, as far as the trust goes, the trust contestant has the burden to prove by clear and convincing evidence, but what they what they have the benefit of is a shifting burden where if they establish, if certain Victoria factors, in this case, right. if they can establish that there was a confidential relationship between the alleged undue influencer, which that was stipulated to, or the no dispute on here, and, there was, and he was a substantial beneficiary, which there's no dispute on that, and he actively procured those changes, those contested documents. And I think here, the facts are, there are, are several facts that the trial court could rely on to establish that there was active procurement. Now, in the case of Brock, uh, I'm sorry, the estate of Brock, out of the First District Court of Appeal, here there was a, uh, a contest, it was a will contest and on a, of a t testamentary trust. Now that court found that in addition to the carpenter factors, well they, they, they addressed the carpenter factors and they said each case involving allegations of active procurement must be decided in reference to its particular facts. Carpenter, which is a similar case on undue influence and shifting the burden, uh, give some guidance with the factors they lay out there, but a will or a trust contestant is not required to show every single one of those, but the court must look at the facts of that particular case. And most importantly, I think, uh, this court finds that where there is an inequality of mental strength, active procurement can be shown by evidence of a request or suggestion of a dominant party. Now here we definitely had an inequality of mental strength between Mark D. Sclafani and his mother, Martha Di Sclafani. We had testimony from Anna Di Sclafani, Mark, uh, Mark's wife at the time. By the time the trial came around, she was his ex-wife. She testified via deposition. She said at the time the documents were signed in 2003, including the IRA beneficiary designation, she said that Mark controlled all of, all of Martha's life outside of Freedom Village, the home where she moved into in late November of 2002. And Victoria testified that she noticed changes in her mother's mental awareness after, well, both before and after her cancer surgery, which was in 1999. 
she attributed some of that mental, uh, those mental issues to alcoholism as well as the, uh, the cancer surgery. But later Martha moved to Bradenton, Florida near Mark and his wife Anna and, and their family. And during this time Anna also testified that she noticed a cognitive decline. She confirmed that Martha drank every day and Anna described Martha and the whole family as, as alcoholics. How old was Martha at that point? She passed away in 2008 when she was 76. So in 2002, she was 70. Okay. And I wasn't expecting to have to do a math problem there, but she was 70 when, when uh, the will was, when the trust was signed, approximately 70. And then uh, during the appellant's argument, this court asked about the medical condition that, um, uh, Martha's medical condition. She was treated by Dr. Rates, which was her primary care physician when she moved to Bradenton. He diagnosed her with early dementia, probably early dementia, I think was his quote. He testified via deposition and his medical records were stipulated into evidence. He said that she was suffering from hallucinations and continued memory deficits on November 10, 2000. Martha was also treated by Dr. Edmund Grant, a neurologist, from November 15, 2000 through February 13, 2001. He diagnosed her with early dementia, recommended that she discontinue the use of all alcohol, and recommended an inpatient alcohol program to assist if necessary. So he found her alcohol consumption and the state of her, her dementia at that point to be very serious. And this is in 2000. This is approximately two and a half years before the contested trust documents were signed, approximately two and a half years, or approximately two years before Martha moved into an assisted living facility once she became unable to live on her own. Anna DiScafani testified that Mar Martha, in fact, stopped seeing Dr. Reitz because she was upset that he recommended that she stop drinking alcohol. Now, Doc, there was a letter from Dr. Chen admitted into evidence stating that Martha was capable of making her own decisions. As Mr. Chapman stated, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chen did not testify and his records were not located but the letter came in, came into evidence as it was in, uh, it was in Fran DeGraw, the estate plan attorney's file. Now, the court said that she gave, or uh, the trial judge said that she gave little weight to this letter of competency because Dr. Chen was unable to testify and we do not know how he arrived at his, at his opinion. But Anna DiScafani testified that she took Martha to Dr. Chin's office on January 17, 2003 to obtain that letter, quote, because Mark wanted a competency test performed on Martha because he knew his sister was going to do what she's doing now. So this is part of, um, we'd alleged in the trial court and argued in the trial court, this was part of Mark's overall scheme that began with a falling out between really, what the trial judge found was really between Mark and Victoria when she moved down to help Martha or to help Mark transition Martha into an assisted living facility. You heard a reference to letters that were written by my client, Victoria DiScofani, to her mother that stated, you know, take me out of the will. Well, she testified at trial that she did write those letters. She was upset. Mark had, uh, based on Anna's testimony, had went over to Victoria or to Martha's house where Victoria was staying with her mother and, quote, kidnapped her and took her back to Mark's home. Victoria was very upset by this. This resulted in a, a I think the quote was a big old fight. The trial judge found that that big old fight was really between Mark and Victoria, not between Martha and Victoria. Victoria testified that she wrote those letters to show her mother that she was not interested in her money and said, if it makes you happy, take me out of your will. And it was not, uh, and she was hoping that it would uh, allow them to, to, to mend and to make up once she told her she was not interested in that because she was concerned that's what Mark had, had told her mother. Now, in appellant's argument, he had, or, uh, he had talked about the estate planning documents in 2003 and how those were initiated. Well, those were initiated by a call from Mark to Fran de Graal. Now, there was mention that Fran de Graal testified that Martha had always wanted to remove Victoria <coughs> as a beneficiary from her estate planning documents, but she talked her out of it. On direct examination, Ms. de Graal could not give any reasons why Martha would ever tell her she wanted to take Victoria out. There was no indication in her notes that Victoria ever told 
Fran DeGraw that she wanted to take Victoria, that Martha ever told Fran DeGraw that she wanted to take Victoria out of her state planning documents. In fact, <coughs> Victoria's share under uh, Martha DeSclafani's estate plan actually increased over the years in the 90s. In 92, it was reduced down where she shared her third with her daughter Amber DeSclafani. Well, I'm sorry, uh, yes, Amber DeSclafani. And then in 95, in the next amendment, Victoria's share went back to a third, and then the other third, which was going to, to um, uh, Martha's son Antonio, was then divided between his children. But if his children did not survive, then Victoria and her daughter became the contingent beneficiary. So there was actually a, a chance, it all be a remote chance, that she could have inherited more than Mark under that, under that plan. Then the next amendment was in 97, which we contend was the last valid amendment. Victoria and Mark split the residuary after some specific devises to two grandchildren, including Antonio's grandchildren, who was removed from the uh, Antonio, who was removed from the estate plan in '95. Now, when Mark called, he told he told Martha, or he told Fran de Graal, and it's important to note that Fran de Graal, when she testified, she had been retired since 2005 from the practice of law, and upon one of the first questions that I'd asked her was, what is your current address? She had pulled a card out of her pocket to testify what her address was at that time. So I would submit that her memory was not, was not that good at, at that time. But her file was very well documented, and her file showed that the first contact to initiate the 2003 document was from Mark. And in fact, there was no there was no contact from Martha until there was a do at least documented in her file or that she could recall until there was a discussion about the execution of the documents. It's also important to note that Fran de Graal was not present when Martha executed the documents at Freedom Village. Mark de Sclafani was present or at least he signed on the same day with the same notary and the same witnesses because he was then becoming the, the successor trustee so he signed in that capacity. Fran de Graal dictated the memo to prepare this document to remove Victoria Di Scofani as a, as a beneficiary. And the only phone call, the only contact that we have documented, documented in her file was on January 22nd, where there was a telephone call between Martha and Mr. Graal. Mr. Graal testified that she had no idea who else was in the room, that she had no idea about any medical diagnoses that uh, Martha Di Scofani had received there was no indication that she made any finding or inquiry as to the decedent's testamentary capacity. And then the document was, was executed there. Mark retained the original documents. And uh, Mr. Grawl testified that she did not know the witnesses. She did not know the, know the notary. And then to further document Mark's involvement, he paid for the, for the execution or for the preparation of these documents by mailing Fran de Graal a check, albeit from Martha's funds. He mailed the check, he signed the check, <coughs> and he included a note to Fran de Graal saying, Fran, thanks a lot for your help. Thanks a lot for your help uh, preparing this document that made me the sole beneficiary. He didn't say that, but that's, that's what it meant. And then as far as the IRA, beneficiary designation. Under our claim for tortious interference, we have to prove that Victoria Di Scofani had an expectancy. Under case law in Florida, an expectancy is defined as a reasonable certainty that a person would inherit but for the wrongful conduct of someone else. Now we've alleged that the wrongful conduct is all part of, of Mark's scheme to make himself the sole or his family the sole beneficiaries of Martha's estate or, or her assets. Now the RA would not have passed through her trust but had beneficiaries designated on it. So he had to cover his bases with that. <clears throat> All of this scheme started, as I said earlier, in the fall of 2002 after Martha, late fall of 2002, after Martha moved into assisted living where Anna testified that Mark controlled all of her activities outside of, of the assisted living facility. Mark had asked Anna, as I said earlier, to get the note from Dr. Chen. And then we have testimony from, 
from Anna as to Martha's expectancy. Anna did not testify live at trial, but her deposition was read in. And she testified as to, after the big old fight, she said in response to a question from Mr. Chapman, did you ever take Martha to visit Drew Dill while he was oldie? Yes. Did you ever have, did you ever go, do you recall an occasion when Martha asked you to drive her to Drew Dill's office to make a change to her beneficiary form? Yes. When was that? That was when all that altercation stuff went on and she wanted to take her out, meaning Victoria, referencing that based on Anna's testimony, Martha recognized that Victoria was a beneficiary of the IRA. Do we know <clears throat> during her lifetime whether because I'm assuming these changes were to the IRA were made in 2003, right? Correct. And they were stayed in place until Martha's death five years later. Or so. the, the change in 2003 only stayed in place <coughs> for another year. The change in 2003 was signed in January of 2003. And I believe Drew, De Drew Deal testified by his affidavit that was stipulated in that it was his handwriting on the form and this one designated Mark DeSclafani and Anna DeSclafani. This is a form through H&R Block. The IRA was held by Oldie Discount Advisors, was then transferred to H&R Block and this designated Mark DeSclafani and Anna DeSclafani as equal beneficiaries. Then I believe the IRA was transferred to Morgan Stanley on February 18th, 2004 there was another change of beneficiary designation form once it was opened at, Mo at Morgan Stanley. This one, Mark DeSclafani testified, he filled out, had his mother sign. This one designated <coughs> Mark as the sole beneficiary with Anna DeSclafani as the contingent beneficiary. And is there any evidence one way or the other as to whether she knew or appreciated what those documents did? Whether Martha knew or appreciated? Because yes. it's her expectation expectancy that we worry about in one of these cases. Isn't, is, isn't that correct? That is correct. Tortious interference is a tort directed at a wrong committed on the on the test air. And here the only testimony we have about Martha's knowledge or understanding of the RA was a testimony from Anna that I had just read where she told Anna take me based on Anna's testimony I want to take her out meaning Victoria. So she from that we can glean that she understood that there was a beneficiary and she understood that it needed to be changed. <coughs> but that was from Anna's, from Anna's testimony, but we don't have any, and that's one of the interesting things. Is it, without regard to, you know, a competent, you know, a guardianship proceeding, is it, is, does their record indicate at what point this woman was probably no longer competent to make these kinds of decisions? Well, as far as competent, competency, uh, as the court knows, is a, is a fluid thing and it right. fluctuates. But uh, there is no, I think it's extremely hard uh, to show when the, a bright line when somebody lacks capacity. But I think here there is evidence that Martha was no longer to live on her own in the fall of 2002 and she was diagnosed with dementia but in 2000. you're signing all these documents, no one's con con contesting her capacity to, to sign these documents. It's whether she was unduly influenced, I suppose. I guess I'm more interested in was there a point later on where she couldn't appreciate what was in them to change them back to what her true intentions were. In uh, 2005, I believe Dr. Rates, uh, his records indicate that he diagnosed her as clearly demented or fully demented or something to that effect. So I would argue it was that time when By she time. could no longer, but uh, as early as 2000, she had a diminished capacity, which I would argue made her more susceptible to undue influence. I mean, you stand to argue that somebody with full capacity would be much more hard, would be, be much more difficult to unduly influence them to do something they didn't want to do. And then as far as the um, influence with the IRA beneficiary designation, as I said, that was part of the, of the overall plan. You know, we can't view that change in a vacuum. We don't have any testimony that, you know, Mark put the form in front of her and had her sign it. But we, what we do have is testimony that he controlled her whole life at that point that he took all of the steps to have her trust amendment in 2003 changed. In fact, I would submit all the evidence indicates that none of these changes could have occurred without Mark's substantial involvement. And his involvement 
benefited him directly or his family directly. They didn't benefit anyone else. And one of the things that um, I'd like to point out that the only witness that was offered in the um, appellee, or appellant's case in chief at trial was the testimony of Mark DeSclafani. The court noted in its final judgment that, that the trial judge found him to be less than credible. <clears throat> there was no independent person who could testify that they looked Martha DeSclafani in the eye and she told them, this is what I want. I think the best witness in most of these cases is the attorney who prepared the documents, who can say, I sat right across the table from the decedent, from the testator, from my longtime client, who I knew very well. They looked at me in the eye and said, this is exactly what I want to do, and I felt very confident that was what they wanted to do. But there was no such person in this case who could testify in defense of these documents. Fran de Graal did not see. Fran de Graal did not, was not involved in the execution of these documents. There is no third party, there is no financial advisor to say they felt very comfortable with this change. So I would submit to the court <coughs> that the trial court's final judgment should be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chapman. Thank you. Uh, just to, uh, to get, I guess, address a few things. First about, as far as uh, Martha's capacity, uh, Dr. Rates had testified, he, he testified in depth about how dementia works and how Alzheimer's works and, and said it's not necessarily, it can be a, a linear scale or it can be, it, it can be abrupt. He said it's kind of hard to tell, but he did say that he thought there was a gray area where there was questionable whether she could make her decisions or not. Martha could make decisions. And he put that gray area, I believe, like towards the end of 2004 or so. Uh, and certainly he said by the beginning of 2005, absolutely did not think she had the capacity to make decisions. But he said there was a gray area a little bit before that. But he also agreed, uh, even though he was not a treating physician at the time, he agreed with Dr. Chin's uh, uh, opinion in January of 2003 that in 2003 Martha would have had the ability to make those decisions. And yes, as far as Fran de Gras, she didn't sit across from Martha, but she did say uh, in her memo of January 23rd, um, prior to the document being signed, that she spoke with, uh, with uh, Martha, so she's stated emphatically that she, not, she does not want to provide any provision for Victoria nor, for Victoria nor her children so she was very confident the provisions were exactly what Martha wanted. She had no doubt that she had the testimony capacity at the time to make those decisions. This is the estate planning attorney. She's got, she's got nothing to grind against, uh, no ax to grind with Victoria or whatever else. She's, she's trying to protect Martha's decisions. And in her mind, this is exactly what Martha wanted to do and that she is trying to document that to carry out Martha's true intent, which is really what we're trying to get at anyway here. Um, uh, just to hit briefly about as far as the burden, you know, you can show active procurement uh, all day long. You can find active procurement, but that doesn't end the inquiry in itself. Active procurement then shifts the burden to the, to the alleged influencer to, to, to show a, a reasonable basis for, what, for their involvement. And here, if there, to the extent there was active procurement, why was Mark involved? Well, because my mother was getting older and I started handling things for her. That's why I was involved. Is that unreasonable? No, it's not unreasonable. That's the, the Derevotian case all over that the, uh, the, the, the explained that the daughter was more active than I believe her mother's uh, estate and was handling some things for, for her and so that's why she was involved. But then if that's the case, once there's a reasonable explanation given, then it shifts back to the contestant again to show undue influence. Uh, and we talked about what that burden was before. Clearly, that, that was not shown here. Uh, we did not have any, uh, you know, there was lots of evidence about what Martha wanted and how clear Martha was about what she wanted to do with regard to Victoria. Um, there was plenty of time if this was a situation where maybe Martha was just mad at Victoria briefly, uh, that she could have changed her mind later on, but she never did. So I think that's important as well. Um, the, um, the, the Kester case talked about the, the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, a, a child who is, uh, you know, watching out for a parent. I believe that's what the evidence was here. The evidence here that Mark, when his mother lived in Naples after his father died, he regularly, he and his wife visited on a regular basis driving down from Manatee County to Naples. 
uh, when she moved to Bradenton. They, she moved close by to them. They regularly engaged her in their social and church activities and that type of thing. They became part of, uh, of Martha's life. They start, stayed part of Martha's life. So it's, it's not unusual that maybe Martha would turn to Mark for help. All right. But anyway, Your Honors, I would ask that the court uh, reverse the trial court's opinion and remand and enter judgment in favor of Mark. Thank you.